greetings to you all. I'm speaking to you from uh, Bethlehem on New Year's Day and recording this uh, presentation, which will be about 15 minutes about the situation in uh, the area. Uh, our area is, of course, part of the Fertile Crescent, where humans first developed agriculture. And you can see from this that uh, we domesticated things like wheat, barley, lentils, chickpeas, dates, peas, pistachios, etc., over 10,000 uh, years ago, 10,000 BC. So we're talking about 12,000 years of uh, civilization here. Jericho, for example, is the oldest continuously inhabited town on earth in the Fertile Crescent. And um, our location is also lucky in that it is at the pivotal point between continents and so we get 500 million birds migrating through Palestine annually between Eurasia and Africa. This land, the land of Canaan, which is the western part of the Fertile Crescent, uh, had civilizations, of course, that uh, allowed us to develop things like the alphabet and uh, to have uh, uh, mechanisms of agriculture that are still practiced today. Here's the alphabet, for example, the modern Latin alphabet comes from the early Aramaic, Phoenician Aramaic alphabet, and, uh, and this also gave rise to the Nabataean and early Arabic alphabets, also gave rise to the Hebrew alphabet. The native people of this land, which you can see here, uh, my grandfather dressed just like the gentleman in the lower left-hand corner. This is, uh, these are the people who lived here, the native people. They traced their ancestry to Canaanites, um, and before that, the Natufian agricultural period. In fact, the embroidered dresses of Palestinian women include some Canaanitic symbols, uh, symbols from the Canaanites. We do have a political problem here, and I'll say a few words about it. We have, of course, an idea called Zionism, which was instituted by the British early on in the 19th century. Um, the coining of the term Zionism came in the 1860s, and then Theodor Herzl came in 1897, and he thought that it's a good idea to have a Jewish state in Palestine. At the time, he had the first Zionist Congress in 1897. He had basically uh, observed uh, by sending two rabbis to Palestine that 97% of the population was not Jewish, 3% was Jewish. So the problem for the Zionists was how to make a country that's multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multicultural as a Jewish state of Israel. This is the population demographics at the time of the beginning of the Zionist movement. As you see, uh, many more Palestinian Arabs than Jewish population. Even with Jewish immigration, it would not have been possible to form a Jewish state. So the idea was to uh, take care of the natives, and the natives were to be removed. And there are quote after quote. I won't uh, waste your time reading all the quotes or sending you all the quotes. I'm happy to do that if you want. Uh, but for example, Ben-Gurion said, we have, uh, we, there's no room for us and what he called the Arabs, which are the native Palestinians, that they have to leave. So European Jews wanted to come here and establish a Jewish state. They needed support of uh, empires, and they got the support of the British and the French Empire, first in the form of the Sykes-Picot agreements, and then in the form of the Balfour and Cambon declarations in support of the Zionist project. The bottom line, everybody knew at the time, uh, early on in the late 19th century, early 20th century, everybody knew what this entailed. This entailed the removal of the native people. Uh, the Zionists knew it, the Palestinians knew it, the British and the French knew it. And, uh, and if you want to read about the history of the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, you can read Ilan Pape's book, called the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Bottom line is today more than two-thirds of us are refugees or displaced people pushed uh, basically into the sea, as you see in the picture in the lower left-hand corner. 
or uh, loaded onto trucks or forced to march a la the March of Tears of Native Americans from Florida to Tennessee. This is the population of Palestinians today, worldwide Palestinian population, and what you see is that we are 12.7 million Palestinians, uh, mostly still around the area in the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, the area occupied by Israel in 1948 when, area, when Israel was created. That is 78% of Palestine that Israel was created on. Uh, and removed in the process 500 Palestinian villages and towns. In 1967, Israel expanded to the remainder of Palestine, which is the West Bank and Gaza, and proceeded to build settlements. And on the map on the right, you can see basically the uh, distribution of the Israeli colonies inside the West Bank. In the Bethlehem district, uh, there are over 23 settlements that are housing uh, 150,000 Israeli Jewish set settlers in these Jewish-only colonies. And we Palestinians have been reduced to the central area of Bethlehem, where Bethlehem University is, and where we are pressured with checkpoints, with preventing us from getting to Jerusalem or getting to our olive groves or any of the normal activities that people do. This is, uh, uh, you know, the situation now is basically that you have uh, Palestinians living on only 8.3% of the land of historic Palestine and 91.7% of the land is uh, under the control of the Jewish-Israeli government. This is similar to what happened in South Africa under apartheid. And, uh, and this is the shrinking of the land is not happening suddenly. It's happening over decades. And you can see from this map what Palestine used to be like in 1920. And then uh, today, and the map is out of date, of course, 1998. But that was the first shrinking map of Palestine done in 1998 uh, by my son and I, and it was uh, basically inspired by the shrinking map of the United States, which you see below it. Um, this is uh, what we define as settler colonialism. Settler colonialism has certain characteristics. It is not such a bad diagnosis, by the way, because most countries have lived through settler colonialism, whether in South America or Central America, North America, uh, Southeast Asia, Africa, etc. And most of the time, the scenario that uh, is produced at the end of settler colonialism is coexistence and people living in one country, as you see in Brazil, Mexico, Canada, and so forth. Rarely do we see models like Algeria, where the colonizers lose, or models of genocide as happened in Australia and uh, in the United States to a large extent. There are certain characteristics of this. Um, uh, this, you know, has many symptoms and I don't have time to go through them, but on the environmental issues, for example, this is one of the colony uh, in the Bethlehem region and the map I showed you earlier in the blue were all the colonies. This colony is called Har Homa. It's built on Jabal Abu Ghnaim, and on the top is what it looked like in 1997 and the bottom is what it looked like in uh, today, what it looks like today. And we did some study at the Palestine Museum of Natural History, part of Bethlehem University, on the decline in vertebrate biodiversity in Bethlehem as a result of these uh, human activities. There are other symptoms, for example, unequal distribution of water, which you see here, the West Bank Gaza Strip uh, receive less water than what the World Health Organization recommends for a healthy living. Um, and. Uh, of course, there are areas that are worse. Gaza is actually on the brink of genocide. There are nearly two million people. Even the United Nations said it would be unlivable by 2020, and this was a study they did in 2012. So actually, um, after that, there was a war on Gaza that 
decimated its infrastructure. So Gaza actually is unlivable now with two million people living in an area that's very small with limited natural resources. Most of them are refugees or displaced people. Uh, another symptom of this is unequal treatment of people. For example, any Palestinian refugee cannot return to his or her homes and lands, whereas any uh, Jewish person in the world or convert to Judaism can come here, get automatic citizenship, and live on stolen Palestinian land and travel freely wherever they want to. Uh, we have had resistance to this, of course, uh, beginning uh, at the beginning of Zionism in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century. And these Palestinian women, for example, Christians and Muslims who went to meet with the British High Commissioner in the 1920s, they held the first demonstration in human history that used automobiles, cars, where they managed to gather 120 cars and uh, in Jerusalem, all streets and drive them through, uh, making big fuss. Uh, religious leaders had a significant impact on the resistance. And these are, this is a gathering of religious leaders in 1932, uh, including Christians of various denominations, Muslims of various denominations, Druze, and even rabbis uh, were part of this group. Uh, some of these uh, religious leaders who opposed Zionism and opposed the British occupation ended up in British jails. For example, this is a picture in 1936 in a British jail in Jerusalem where you see four Muslim religious leaders and two Christian religious leaders. Um, spending time in jail has become a common feature of this. Israel has arrested and imprisoned over 700,000 native Palestinians so far. 15% uh, of Palestinian males today in the West Bank and Gaza, um, uh, over th 30 years of age, has, uh, have spent that time in Israeli prisons. Uh, there has been in the past three or so weeks since Trump made his announcement about Jerusalem, uh, 1,500 pal more Palestinians were arrested, uh, were taken, and 600 of them are children. It took 24 uh, soldiers to arrest this one child, as you can see. Uh, and lately they arrested my friends, for example, the family of the Tamimis. This is uh, the Ahd Tamimi who started challenging the Israeli occupation, as you see in the picture in the upper left-hand corner, when she was nine years old. And she is arrested now. She is in jail, she is in jail and she's facing long sentences, uh, supposedly for having slapped a soldier who was actually standing in her front yard uh, illegally occupying soldiers. Um, <clears throat> we also, as Palestinians, engage in international activists in supporting us. And there is uh, the International Solidarity Movement, which was started in my village of Beit Sahur. This movement has helped protect the Church of Nativity, as you see here, when they sneaked in and stopped the shelling of the church. Some of internationals have paid the heavy price for this. For example, Rachel Corey, who was killed when she was 23 years old. Uh, she came to my village, we trained her in nonviolent resistance, and then uh, she went stood in front of a bulldozer and she was killed 16 March 2003. Uh, there was attempts also to break the siege on Gaza that were faced with uh, lethal weapons. Uh, for example, this is the Turkish ship uh, Mavi Marmara. Uh, on which 10 Turkish citizens were killed and many, many others injured. For us in Palestine, of course, everything we do is a form of resistance. So we say to exist is to resist, and I wrote a book about this uh, called Popular Resistance in Palestine. For example, these girls going to school in Bethlehem as such is a form of resistance. Or these girls in Hebron trying to get to their class, the soldier prevents them and uh, they sit in the street and have their class. Or when we climb walls or we protest against the walls or we tear down the walls, these are all forms of nonviolent resistance. 
the destruction that the state of Israel and the colonial powers uh, do to the native population is tremendous, of course, and the natives try to challenge this in many ways by hanging on to their lands, for example, by going to the field to feed the sheep, even when the, uh, when the settlers put these poison pellets, which you see here, um, to poison her sheep. That's a form of nonviolent resistance. At Bethlehem University, of course, we are engaged in this kind of resistance because when our students come to classes, they are engaged in nonviolent resistance because they go through checkpoints and we had cases which brother peter can tell you about of people who were harassed uh, for example to come to uh, from gaza and, and deported to gaza and so forth uh, so we we do an amazing job at bethlehem university in a form of nonviolent resistance by graduating our students, educating them for the future so that they use their minds instead of using weapons, they use their minds to uh, challenge the occupation. And we have many, many ways at Bethlehem University where we engage in those kinds of nonviolent resistance. For example, we have an Institute of Community Partnership and we have an Institute of Sustainability and Biodiversity that works to educate children, for example, about uh, science, about how they can grow their own vegetables even, about nature, protection of nature, environmental conservation. We take them to the field. For example, you see the T-shirt of the student says respect for the environment. Uh, equals respect for ourselves. We grow our own vegetables now in parts of Bethlehem University and we grow fish and frogs and recycle uh, trash, for example, as you see here, bring students to learn how to recycle trash, uh, paper, etc. Um, we pay a price for this. Uh, many of our faculty and students were arrested. Some students were killed. We had uh, six uh, martyrs already, or seven martyrs actually, from Bethlehem University. And uh, I myself was arrested many times. These are pictures of me being arrested as a professor at Bethlehem University. Um, I would like to end by saying that uh, there is hope. We are very, very hopeful people. We believe in working for peace and justice. We believe in coexistence. I, as a Palestinian Christian, work with Palestinian Muslims, work with Israeli Jews to resist uh, apartheid and oppression. And so uh, I would like to just leave you with the uh, question mark of what uh, are we going to do together in 2018 since, as I said, I'm recording this on the first day of 2018 to advance peace and justice, to advance Bethlehem University as a beacon, of, as an oasis of hope, as an oasis of uh, peace and justice in Palestine. Thank you very much and I'm happy uh, to Skype with you if there is time for that so that we can uh, answer any question.